Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with me your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 458 that's 458 how are you guys doing how are you guys feeling wherever you may be great amazing good to hear if it's your first time checking out the show you know what to do smash that like hit subscribe leave me a comment down below if you listen via the podcast app a five-star review will help to get the show a long way i've seen a lot of five-star reviews already i think i'm up to about 10 ratings already if i can get to 20 that would be much appreciated and i'll stop badgering you about it so please help me get to 20 ratings on the apple podcast app that would be greatly appreciated leave me a five-star review if you like what you're hearing if you like what you're hearing and of course support for your patron is always more than welcome to at patreon.com for slash a-g-o-s-t-i-n-h-o i put bonus episodes on there every week so make sure you check that out for as little as one dollar for as little as one pound per month you can get access to all my bonus episodes available on patreon.com for slash agostino so if you enjoy this show and you want some bonus episodes <laughs> make sure you click on to patreon.com for slash a-g-o-s-t-i-n-h-o for more info don't delay do it today oh mate how are you guys feeling i'm feeling good in case you are wondering i'm feeling pretty fantastic i'm not gonna lie uh being in the gym you know basically what three days a week and then running three days a week which leaves one day a week of rest has really got me back in a good mood you know what i mean it's got me back in a swing of things it's got me back up right and proper where i actually should be doing amazing things the only thing i have to reintroduce back into my schedule now is reading i've been slacking off that for a while now so if i can get the reading back into tune that will then eventually lead to me doing the language learning and then when i get the language learning back in tune i've basically got my main three pillars that made me feel awesome and amazing and i have to be honest right this last or oh, well, yeah this run i've been on now the moment it's been like a month i think since gyms have been reopened or something a month yeah it feels like a month it's probably a month i have to be honest i'm really enjoying the um the things that i hated about it which was going and uploading pictures of myself in from the gym well not pictures of myself but like pictures of me you know um standing next to a bunch of weights or on the way there or whatever it may be and i'm loving it now you know why i don't know there's something about the satisfaction of knowing that you're probably one of the only people in your friendship group that's actually up at that time usually when i go gym on like monday wednesdays and fridays i try to go at like 6 a.m and um i try to get obviously you know get there on time and shit so that means leaving my house maybe quarter to six whatever maybe to walk over to the gym and i love it i love posting the little clip of me walking or a time step image of me on the way there because i know more likely than not everyone else you know on my flipping uh friend list is probably in bed snuggled you know comfy uh or kind of you know um getting over the effects of a flipping hangover or something and here i am in a gym going good you no know, here i am on my way to the gym and it's something i kind of found a bit cringy beforehand but now i'm kind of um enjoying the fact that i'm the only one doing it and i'm also enjoying the fact that i'm doing it during a pretty easy time to be lazy if this there, if there was a one time in the history of the world for you to like you know blame your ills on the world and say it's unfair and kind of cry into your pillow woe is me sort of thing this would be it and this would be a perfect time to do so no one would give you any flack no one would say you're being a debbie downer you'd be exactly within your rights to say man this year's been horrendous um this hadn't happened that didn't happen and i'm just gonna sit here and hope things change everyone will be perfectly fine with it or i'm just gonna sit here and not make you know and not try and better myself in any way shape or form and everyone will be fine with it right they'd be completely fine with it and i guess that's what i'm trying to buck i'm trying to go against um i'm trying to do the hardest thing during now which is sitting still and resting on your laurels and i'm trying to you know again better myself better my health my body my mind all that sort of stuff so i'm absolutely loving the fact that i'm giving myself uh you know i'm kind of jacking myself off by posting these pictures of me going to the gym early in the morning because <laughs> no one else is doing so it just makes me feel better than everyone else i don't know what else to say <laughs> it's horrible to say this because i remember this is one of the main things that sort of stopped me kind of posting books i read on social media number one because i don't like posting books if i'm not going to read them so that's a bit corny you know some people do that thing they just post a book or they'll sit 
in front of a bookshelf that they haven't read i don't do that every book in this house for the most part with the exception of a couple i've read every single one of them cover to cover and if not i've dumped them maybe in the in halfway because sometimes you know you should do that if you have books and you don't actually enjoy them don't just stick with them because you know you feel like you have to stick with them similar to like tv series people will tell you oh if a tv series is crap let it, you know if if you don't like a tv series for instance because it's all subjective some people just don't like the sopranos however nutty that may sound some people just don't think it's you know it's up to par or they don't it's not necessarily something they're into you should be a, you should be within your right and you should make it your mission if you don't like something to just drop it and move on to the next there's too much good content out there um there's too many great experiences to enjoy too many friends to go and hug for you to be spending your time hoping a tv series gets better it's just not worth it in the end in my opinion I've, there's never been a tv series i've watched where i've stuck with it even though i didn't really like it and it's been you know a net benefit you know I mean, it's, it's been enjoyable. It's been all right because it's something to kind of distract you from, you know, doing whatever else you need to do in your life. But it's nothing that's really moved the needle um, for that intense purposes. But yeah, I recommend my main thing is if you don't like something, leave it. Now, the only thing I don't really, I'm not really a fan of when it comes to that is cinema. I know some people are really into the whole thing of like, oh, if they go to cinema to go watch a movie and it's not really their vibe, they just leave whenever they're not liking it. And I don't really, I'm not into that. I think if you pay the money and you've done the whole, you know, act of going, you bought your popcorn, da 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 you know I mean, you've got your snacks. It's just not worth it to leave. You just might as well run it through. Um, and usually, I don't know, for me, usually when I go to cinema, I don't usually have things planned around it. It's usually cinema and then you have some loose plans, but nothing set in stone. It's kind of like, mm, because you never know when the film's going to start or when it's going to end. You you have a, you have the runtime, but you know, with the adverts and stuff, you never know when things are going to go. So you just kind of leave it kind of open um, and you sort of freestyle. Maybe you're going to go to a bar later. So I'm no, I'm in no rush to go anywhere else unless you're like, oh, I had these other plans I had to do. Fair enough. But I'm not really a big fan of that sort of thing. So I don't know. Like I said, man, um, um, I find it difficult, or going back to the books thing, posting the books on my social media. Number one, because if I wasn't reading them, it just felt corny. And number two, I just felt like I was, you know, you know, doing that whole, oh, I'm really smart thing. You know what I mean? And I don't really want to do that. It's just something I'm into. Because my thinking behind it was like, there was a period in time where on my social media feed, I, used to, I was kind of known for sharing loads of party pictures, right? When I used to go out a lot, when I was doing a lot of party promotion, when I was DJing all the time. No, actually, I wasn't DJing. This is a funny thing, actually. I wasn't DJing as much then. I was going out a lot, but my face was on the scene. I felt like I was taking part, but I actually wasn't DJing, like practicing at home, you know, recording mixes, um, playing in pubs and bars. I wasn't doing it. The moment I had to kind of like, which is flipped up but it's what it is you have to choose one or the other you can't do both you can't be a party kid and try and dj you have to kind of decide what you want to do and then you sort of like make it work that way so if you want to dj somewhere it might mean that then that's the only place you can go and party so you might play a set and then after you finish then you can get kind of get on it but in terms of being the kid in a rave friday to sunday and also trying to pursue a djing career or however small or big it is it's just not going to happen um so yeah um i used to always post pictures of me out and about right pictures of me flipping having shot you know the really corny ones having shots a picture of my i did that corny thing that people do where you post a picture of your pint like it just looks like piss on the, in a cup like no one cares right but at that time you think you're the coolest guy in the world or a picture of your shoes on the way to the club it's just ridiculous so my thinking behind it was that if that's okay and i used to get pretty decent engagement all that sort of stuff right people used to like it or they'll comment oh my god yeah there'll be a good little back and forth to it What's the difference with me posting books I'm reading? Why is that any worse? Do you know what I mean? But if you know, if you speak to any person that's like a, a full-time social media person or influence or public figure, they'll let you know the moment they post a picture that doesn't inf include their face, especially if they're a girl, it's just them you know, reading up to a book or going on a hike or something, they get far less engagement than all the salacious stuff of you popping bottles, scantily clad, Get, you know looking like you're completely smashed those are the ones that actually get the engagement but the ones of you reading a book you know doing some knitting um learning a language because the, these things aren't going to look amazing on social media they're not really the same reaction so but again I, f I always felt a little bit i don't know it felt a little bit gloaty you know what i mean like i was kind of rubbing my back a little bit too much which i don't like to do but like i said because we've all gone through this unprecedented time where we've all been locked indoors we've all kind of had our dreams aspirations sort of like you know completely extinguished some of our family members are no longer around we everyone's in a really 
tough space and this would be the perfect time to just be like you know what i give up man for this period of time i'm just gonna let this year be a little bit of a flop and just can and just take pick it back up in 2022 but i'm not willing to do that i don't know man our time on this earth is so finite we have so little time on here we don't really realize it because obviously you know we just don't but i'm not willing to you know just let a year go by because i'm in my funk i'm gonna try and work through it working out you know doing the things that i can do learning a language um to obviously expand my vocabulary and my ability to sort of communicate with different people from around the world and pursue my side hobbies and projects that i want to do to obviously take me out of the depths of poverty and all this sort of stuff like that's what i want to do going forward because i think that's going to be most beneficial but you know maybe i'm talking at my bum here i don't know let me know let me know anyway we've got a lot of things to talk about a lot of things to get in on so if you're you know first time checking in make sure you grab yourself a drink or something to munch on and let's dive on deep and get involved with this bloody show so first things first um number one what i've been doing right so have you guys heard of the tory lane's live stream for playboy please i recommend if you haven't checked it out please do so tory lane's obviously you'd know one of my favorite r&b kind of pop acts at the moment um just in general i love his whole approach especially recently i feel like he's created direction um his uh what, what would you call it he is sort of like um prayer direction and his overall just taste level when it comes to his music right and the way it's put together and mixed and mastered and the sequencing of his albums and his eps it's just perfect if you go back to the earlier chicks tapes it felt like stuff was a little bit you know a little bit haberdashery um you know a little bit rushed a little bit you know hastily put together by some people i don't know whatever it may be but you i've definitely seen an in improvement in his overall aesthetic his videos his music from maybe what a few years ago there's been a market jump it might be because he hired a creative director i'm not too sure but whatever it is someone's doing a really good job there so he did this amazing thing where he prepared like a two-pack i think one was called loser i think loser or loner boy or something and one's called playboy Lona or Playboy, yeah, I think one or two. It's a two pack EP that he put together, and this is kind of off the back of that whole, you know, Megan Thee Stallion situation, which a lot of people are alluding some of the lyrics of this album are can pertain to that. But regardless, it was a really, really good project, like probably one of his best, which makes complete sense considering he went through a very traumatic and maybe career defining experience that he'd make some of his best music that's why people you know will say things like oh if um future breaks up with whoever he's with at the moment he's gonna make his best music because usually that that pain and that turmoil that anguish feeds into the music creatively and it always gives the fans great product which is horrible right because the artists themselves is tortured but we're the ones that are getting the best work it's horrendous but it's that say so yeah, it's for another day anyway one of my favorite albums or eps that he's put together and um he did a live stream concert for it right obviously um in lieu of what's going on with the world at the moment you can't really perform in front of live audiences and if i'm completely honest i did see tory lanes perform as a warm-up for future this was was it future no it was was it future it was future wasn't it? i think it was future it was like the o2 is it either future or travis scott but i'm pretty sure maybe it was one of them i'm not sure who it was but regardless it wasn't great um maybe it was because the o2 is really big and the sound sort of travels and he's got that really um high pitch sort of like singing voice a little bit right it's a little bit high maybe it just kind of resonates really badly but whatever it was it just didn't sound as good as this at all at all it sounded pretty bad and i was pretty disappointed because you know um one of the things that people say a lot about artists is that usually like you 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 kind of i think the idea is that you have a fan on spotify but then you have like a no so you have a support on spotify but then you have like a fan for life when you do your live shows right when they get to see you in person like oh my god this guy's even better than i you know listened to on the mp3 and i didn't get that experience so i was going into this a bit apprehensive but jesus christ it blew my head off this is really really good like he can sing for real for real i'll play a little bit of it and see hopefully i don't get taken down let's see just randomly here but if you, as you can see the set design is sort of like taking inspiration of course from the mixtape or album that came before this with the ashanti on the cover so you know a sort of like late 90s feel um loads of posters on the wall neon lights halogen lights sorry everywhere speakers tape decks <coughs> and stuff in the background which you know this brings back fond memories of recording pirate radio station um sets from before so a really good thing overall let me just see if i can play a little bit of it me off for the finer things fuck me good and then you telling me all kind of things it's like money's got you doing different type of things 
it's really good i recommend it i really recommend check it out um and then, oddly enough you put out a live album too right and this is something i've been banging on about for ages to my friends in private and stuff or in private in public probably on here as well probably moaned about it as well himself but there is a real lack of live albums nowadays and i understand why because they cost a lot of money to put together like for instance to do this show um and to organize everything set design to get everything mixed and mastered and to separate all the tracks well, it's, it's a lot of work to make a live album work right it's not just you recording the, the you know the vocals from from your microphone and just kind of converting it into mp3 um you have to do a lot to make it sound really good but if i remember correctly like when i was listening to metal a lot back in the day um and i still do now but i don't really follow a lot of the new stuff but especially some of the old iron maiden um, albums some stuff from metallica some of those live albums were incredible especially if you never got to go to the show they had a way of somehow trans Preferring that electricity that you felt that they felt in the arena through the tracks it didn't know what it was it maybe it was a t it's like when people say when they go to certain studios you record and it's the voices and the vibes of people from yesteryears are sort of like ingrained in the walls right or in the control or in the mix panel it's that kind of thing and you get a lot with live albums and again i think these days because there's such a prev there's such a plethora of flipping artists around if you really want to differentiate yourself and actually gain a new audience and people that people that weren't really into your stuff can be like oh my god this guy's really dope the best way to do it, i think was to have really good live performances and the best way to show people that you can perform really good live is to either record your sets which is, again is difficult to do and probably expensive and also uh, make a live album which is maybe not as lucrative as just making a new album completely but with the streaming era it probably makes sense because you get a chance to just basically get that same tune in people's ears again for a second time so the live album is amazing the only bad thing i'd say about it the live album is so good it makes it difficult for you to listen to the ep because it, obviously he does a lot of like um improv improvisation um you know when it comes to live performances he goes on these incredible runs they don't really hear on this on the album so it can be a, that's the only bit about it. i'm gonna say is you can go into it cautiously because if you love this live album the ep probably isn't as good even though I like it, I think now I've listened to the li to live album, I can't not listen to anything else. So if you're a fan of R&B, or if you're not even a fan of R&B, and you're just skeptical about Tori and everything that's going on about him, and you just want to get an idea of what he is like an artist, oh, check it out, man, because it's easily amazing. And as you can see, I'm not the only one that thinks that there's 4.6 million views on this, and it came out a few days ago. I think when I watched it, it was like, a, you know, what, 190,000K or something like that, insane. 4.6 million on the flipping live stream for an, an album that's already out wild wild thing and it's only 32 minutes long too so it's a perfect length i think in two in my opinion um he completely smashed it great little live band there he's got in the background set design is on point so if you're familiar with tori or you're not and you want to get a feel of what he's about check out tori lane's live stream playboy live on youtube available now next on the list we have this odd and somewhat uh i think uh, counterproductive news courtesy of the hill it says twitter rolls out tip jar feature it says twitter is rolling out a feature for users to send and receive tips it said on thursday users can enable a tip jar on their account that connects with various payment methods including bandcamp cash app patreon paypal and venmo you drive the conversation on twitter and we want you to make it easier for you to support each other uh, beyond uh, follows retweets and likes today we're introducing tip jar a new way for people to send and receive tips twitter's um, senior product manager esther crawford said in a blog post twitter will not take a cut from the tip sent to users according to the post amazing a spokesperson for twitter told the, uh, the hill the platform does not <coughs> set a limit to how much a user can send or receive for a tip jar the tip jar feature is for rolling out for a limited group of users starting thursday including creators journalists experts and non-profits all accounts using twitter in english will be able to start sending tips to accounts with enabled tips jar the platform said more people will be able to add tips to their profile soon and will be expanded to more languages the tip jar feature is the first step into the platform in an effort to create a new way for users to receive and show support on twitter with money uh, crawford wrote earlier this year twitter said it was exploring the feature that would allow users to charge for exclusive content for a super follow feature so all in all pretty good news <clears throat> i've never been the biggest twitter user in the world i had an original account in 2010 that i've unfortunately enough had to 
let go because I nuked it for some odd reason. Then I started a new one in 2011, I think, which I've got now at the moment. And I didn't really use it too tough. But now I've kind of got into during the lockdown, I've kind of spent a lot more time on yapping. I have to say, it does kind of drive trends socially. Like, I think stuff trends-wise or viral news, I think, starts on Twitter and then kind of, you know, uh, permeates on other social media platforms where I was always under the impression it started on Instagram and Facebook because I was on those things more. Um, if anything, maybe even some of the stories probably land on Reddit first and then from Reddit, someone takes it, puts it on Twitter and then it kind of goes out that way. But either way, the conversations, all that sort of malarkey, definitely get driven there. People get cancelled, I say more so on Twitter than they do on any other platform. So it definitely plays an active role in culture. Um, the only only thing I'd say about it that's annoying, maybe because it's me, because who I follow, there is too much sort of like weight and attention being paid to journalists on there. Um, most of the journalists, regardless of who they write for, have a blue tick, have a check mark. So they're blue tick, you know, they go on a little bit, you know, like a little bit, you know, they've got flipping that like they can't be touched, you know what I mean? Like the shit don't stink and stuff. So that can be a bit annoying. And also because of the nature of Twitter, you know, 250 characters, it just encourages people to consistently hot take so that they can get engagement because i think that's the only way you, it works right unless you've got a bit of viral content you have to say something quite controversial it goes against the grain for you to get any level of attention <clears throat> and then when you get the attention you start complaining then you close your replies on the other two it's not the standard protocol but regardless it makes it a bit cringy to watch because um, i think there's a few people on there one of them is um who i follow chris black who's sort of like a menswear sort of uh journalist sort of dude right who writes you know whatever that sort of stuff and he's another one, cringy one that's always kind of hot taking it all over the place i think it's all slowed down a bit now which is why i tend to follow him because he posts some interesting articles but you know him and a cash in for red scare is always kind of sharing unsolicited hot takes it's just one of them kind of things that you just have to kind of grin and bear it when you're using it so that's one side of the situation that i'm really not that happy about but the other side when it comes to sharing funny bits of content, jokes, stories, you think of that, um, who's that, what's that story of that lady that's a flipping sex worker and she got involved in some crazy thing, right? Remember there was a story, some woman went viral, she was involved in some mad freeway and then, or threesome, sorry, and then somehow that, that, that happened, then she relayed that story onto Twitter and then that went, then, then that ended up getting picked up by a TV company now it's made into a movie or something, remember? So there's loads of these kind of things that happen. So it'd be cool if people had a way to sort of like tip people that way or if somebody fell onto hard times and sent up a GoFundMe, that would be an extra way to kind of get some funds to people and support them right on the platform if in case you don't want to move them because I'm imagining if you had a really bad circumstance happen to you and you need to set up a GoFundMe and you have to bounce people from Twitter to the GoFundMe page you could probably lose people along the way because they're not kind of bothered to enter the details there but if they have a quick way to just quickly send you some money via Twitter I think that'd be a pretty decent thing to do going forward um let's see what the actual feature actually looks like on the screen let's go to here Twitter page so when you go on the person's profile essentially you just click a little button it looks like at the just next to the follow and it says you know a tip and then you can pay directly in app so it works pretty seamlessly at the moment it looks like it's not really linked on the bottom of your tweet which is on the annoying part i'm sure they'll do that later but it's not like you can just you know if someone tweets and every it should be an option where on every tweet you send there's an option to like you know next to the retweet like or whatever buttons are there's an option where you can just click that and basically tip directly from there instead of going to the person's profile but you know whatever it may be um it works it makes sense i, f I love the idea um like i said i love and hate it because it's going to encourage people to be more salacious and risque and share the answers it hot takes it hot takes on there but the platform is pretty dope i think overall um to read and to get an idea of what's going on um you hear you know fucking journalists bickering about the most nonsense thing that ever existed but overall it provides some good entertainment for me so definitely check that out if you're that way inclined next on the list we have this courtesy of wall street journal which is pretty infuriating when i read it it says melinda gates was meeting with divorce lawyers since 2019 to end marriage with bill gates the philanthropist had discussions with lawyers in october 2019 around when the microsoft current founders ties with jeffrey epstein became public we don't need to get into the whole Epstein thing, but you know exactly what I'm going with that guy, innit? Yeah, he's dead now at the moment. So, at the moment, well, he's dead now. So, you know, whatever it may be, but I find this really rich, right? Off the back of them announcing that they're gonna get divorced, and now we have further details that supposedly Melinda Gates was the one that initiated the divorce. So obviously, she was the one displeased with their marriage and their union. 
Then we had news of her renting that incredible island somewhere in the Caribbean for 130000 per night to kind of escape the lure of the cameras, which, you know, understandable. If you had that kind of money and access, most people would do the same thing, especially if you're not like a media, media person in that regard. But the one thing I really dislike about people who are in the public eye who decide to call it quits is this sort of stuff, the kind of digging up of dirt, the muddying of your name, um, the reputational damage that they do when they're going through court proceedings or divorce proceedings, whatever it may be, it's really, really unbecoming. Like, especially people like this who are like in their, what, 60s plus or something. They have three kids. They obviously had a loving marriage for a period of time and now it's ended. Fair, things, some things, things, things begin, things end. It is what it is. But why would you need to muddy the name of your father's children of somebody that you would deem to be your best friend somebody that's going to be an integral part of your life regardless of what happens in the future why would you want to damage that in this way in an attempt to kind of distance yourself or an attempt to paint you out to be the good guy and that person to be the bad guy because by and large it's very unlikely again my opinion it's very unlikely that she had no idea of her husband's ties to jeffrey epstein before that story came out in the first place and if it's true then of course that you know probably gives you an idea as to why their marriage may be ended right the fact that she had no idea that this guy she knew who he was or whatever it's just impossible i think so considering the levels there's the circles that they hobnob in how people gossip in that industry it's just impossible that she had no idea if it is happened like i said if it did happen then obviously it's a good indication that their marriage probably wasn't going to last when those kind of secrets are being kept from people but I just don't see the benefit of sharing this sort of news. Like, why do we need to know this? Why does his reputation need to suffer even more off the back of this? He already kind of ducked this issue in the first place, right? When it kind of got announced or when it got leaked that I think, I think, I'm not alleged, allegedly that Bill Gates was on Jeffrey Epstein's plane or something like that. I don't know what it was, but there was, you know, a lot kind of tying them together and he explained it and sort of kind of kept it moving, dodged and weaved it pretty effortlessly, to be honest, considering, um, you know, how often he's in front of the public eye and all that sort of stuff. And of course, then comes the stuff with the vaccines and, you know, him with holding the patents and all that malarkey. You know, there's a lot of conflicting information out there about him. Um, Elon Musk doesn't seem to be a fan of Bill Gates either, which is another red flag because Elon's a bit of an eccentric himself. So he's not a fan of somebody like him. It just makes you really question the whole thing. And again, I just don't understand why this is being shared. I don't understand why this is. I understand, I know why, because I'm sure as part of the divorce proceedings, if you're able to kind of tarnish someone's name um, in public, then I'm sure that's going to help with how things get settled, whether it means Bill Gates decides to rush through the settlement so he can just stop her talking to the press, um, whether it's something to do with how they divvy up the money, because, you know, there's supposed to be some story came out about, oh, Bill Gates gave her 100 million or 180 million or 180 billion, whatever, 18 billion, something crazy in stocks um, to carry through the proceedings. I don't know. And then he's hired a army of lawyers. Like, it's just a messy affair. And it's just unfortunate that it has to play out in the public. I just don't understand why people can get together and have a really loving relationship. You know, again, these aren't these aren't millennials. These are people that have been in the industry for a long time. They've been professionals for a long time. They've been in the public eye for a long time. They've been wealthy for a very, very long time that they would need to do this sort of like mudslinging thing in public it just feels weird and really really odd so let's read a bit the article here it says the split between bill melinda gates and us last week has been in the works for a long time miss gates consulted with divorce lawyers roughly two years before she filed for divorce from mr gates saying their marriage was irretrievable jesus please just, i can't say that irretrievably broken according to people familiar with the matter and documents reviewed by the wall street journal the 56 year old philanthropist has been working with lawyers at several firms since at least 2019 to unwind the marriage for more than 25 years of more than 25 years according to these people in the documents last monday the billionaire couple announced that they were ending their marriage in a joint statement on twitter they said we no longer believe we can grow together as a couple in the next phase of our lives the couple hasn't said what prompted the split one source closed um, one source of concern of Mr. Gates was um, her husband's dealing with the convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. According to the people and the former employee of their charity, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Miss Gates' concerns about the relationship date far back in 2013 that the former employee said. So she had the concerns about the relationship in 2013, but it only took until 2019 for her to finally say, you know what, I have to leave. For what? Because her reputation would get damaged because her husband was, you know, chumming it up with somebody that was alleged uh flipping um what you think called 
um, human trafficking ring running. He was running a human trafficking ring. Is that what she was doing? I don't take... This is nothing to give yourself a pat on the back with. Again, this is a weird society we live in now where, you know, staying quiet when somebody's getting up to some complete nonsense or associated with somebody they shouldn't be associated with. But then when it doesn't serve, when it doesn't serve you, then you suddenly come out. Now she's suddenly got a voice. Now she's suddenly brave. And again, this isn't some, you know, regular schmegular woman. This is somebody with power, with influence, who could actually make a difference, who could have actually added some sort of, what would you call it, validity to the accusations that were pinned against Jeffrey Epstein, all that sort of stuff we had before this, right? She was somebody that would have been a very valuable resource to kind of pull from, a very valuable advocate. And she stayed quiet, stayed quiet, like everyone else did. So that's what I'm saying. As bad as the monsters are, right? As bad as those Jeffrey Epstein characters are, the Harvey Weinstein characters are, my, in my humble opinion, the worst people are the ones who saw or who were aware or who heard rumours of the situation of what was going on and didn't say nothing because they wanted to keep their job or they wanted to keep their salary. Those are the worst people. Because again, like I said, until the end of time, monsters will always exist. But what the only way we can make a change, the only way we can make an actual difference is if collectively, as a human race, we decide enough is enough and we fob them out, we let the authorities know, we call them out in public, all this sort of stuff. That's the only way the this only way we sort of like curtail um the prevalence of them. But when people sort of like keep quiet to save their jobs and stuff, what do you think monsters do? They use that prevalence for self preservation to their advantage and they offer you money they offer you gigs they do whatever it's like that one woman in the epstein documentary on netflix she was what she was one woman who jeffrey tried it on with i think she might have been an assistant i don't know what she was she obviously um rebuffed jeffrey epstein's advances and then she ended up working for him hiring girls to come through he, then he offered the job and she took it and she then set up girls to go do the very thing that she would didn't want to do um, the couple negotiated a divorce for us COVID-19 pandemic the documents so they have been three children who are now all 18 years old or older maybe that's why they, they waited until that who knows I don't really care in that regard according to the documents reviewed by the journal Miss Gates and her advisors held a number of calls in October 2019 when the New York Times reported that Gates had met with Epstein on numerous occasions Mr. Gates once stayed in late into the night with Miss Epstein's Manhattan townhouse the Times reported uh, Bridget Arnold a spokeswoman for Mr. Gates said in 2019 that the software Morgan, Mr. Epstein had met multiple times to discuss philanthropy. Bill Gates regrets ever meeting with Epstein, recognizes it's an error in judgment to do so. Miss Arnold said at the time that Epstein died in jail in August 2019, awaiting trial on federal charges relating to sex trafficking. Miss Gates, a global advocate for women and girls, had told her husband she was uncomfortable with Epstein after the couple met him in 2013. The former employee of the Gates Foundation said Mr. Gates and some employees of the Gates Foundation continued a relationship with Miss Epstein despite the concerns of the person that said. Yeah, I, I, I don't buy it. I don't buy it. I don't rate it. You're with the guy for 20 plus years. You didn't say nothing during the time. And now you're getting a divorce. Suddenly you've got a voice. Suddenly you're brave. Like, nah, I don't buy it. I'm sorry. I don't buy it. You don't get to be a billionaire philanthropist married to one of the most successful tech entrepreneurs in the history of time and also get to be a victim. I'm sorry, you don't. You just don't. Anyway, let's move on. Um, we've got great news here courtesy of resident advisor a vote held in berlin building housing and urban development committee yesterday declares clubs a cultural institution i say that again berlin declares clubs a cultural institution like if ever there's a reason why berlin is maybe one of the best cities in the world for dance music regardless of what kind of genre you're into and where you stand in terms of the people that you follow this is it man this is it this is incredible news so it says the following um over a year of campaigning has led to a milestone moment for german clubs according to the live music commission an almost unanimous vote yesterday was in favor of a recommendation to change clubs and live venues from entertainment sites to cultural sites tomorrow friday may 7 which will be passed it will be presented to the federal government for final consent a vote follows over a year of work from multi-party parliamentary uh, forum for club culture and nightlife um, they propose that the law is changed so that the building regulations deem clubs and live venues with the demonstrable value as cultural sites they also propose a close about clause for about noise limits so this effectively prevents any club suffering the same fate that bar 25 suffered and so many other cultural institutes within berlin there was another one too that i went to that was black 
that ended up stopping. But anyway, loads of really great venues have been lost over time in Berlin due to gentrification, right? Um, as per usual, happens all over the place. Most metropolitan cities, especially when they have a you pop in sort of like underground subculture, urban -y sort of place where all the artists go to rent warehouse spaces, create their works and create a burgeoning scene, start businesses, eventually catch the attention and the eyes of New York Times writers and all this sort of malarkey. They write lists about the 10 place places to go in this location that then, you know, bumps people up to go there. You get an article in you know, mon monocle or something, and then suddenly everyone in that wants to move over there, and then, you know, there's not, obviously, because most metropolitan cities are run like shit, apart from places in Southeast Asia, there's not a lot of housing, or there's not enough housing to satisfy demand, so effectively people have to come in and just buy plots of land and build these horrendous glass and steel, you know, apartment buildings that no one's going to live in, just so they can be in and amongst things, and then when they start living there, they start complaining about the very things that drew them to those locations, so it's a horrendous thing, it does have some benefits, I, I, can, I can say maybe from the time that I've been living here in London, especially in the area I live in, gentrification has kind of helped give people an opportunity to make some money, you know, basically there's a massive shopping center near where I live where people have basically been employed, this is kind of during the same time, a few years maybe after the Olympics happened, so it could drastically change people's employment prospects, you know, having some level of gentrification in the area but overall it's a net negative for sure so for germany to introduce this new law which basically prevents you know some of our established clubs you look at burger and all these other places places that we kind of hold very dear places that are dear to people that work within the industry and customers alike and punters alike to have a possibility where you can be a future where effectively it guarantees the future of these places for you know until the end of time is really really incredible especially when you consider the life cycle of most clubs in most metropolitan cities is what probably about four years i'd say from time from like you know from it being a thing as a building and also it being a thing as a scene right it's about a four-year cycle every four years there's like a new refresh of people coming in and whatnot so to have this sort of thing is pretty much cool it's really really cool sorry not pretty much cool it's really really cool it's very very incredible i have to be honest it continues aside from the culture recognition the sex of venues will benefit from tax breaks, be protected from displacement and be permitted to operate in more parts of the city, which will, will definitely um, be a net benefit overall, you know, allow people because there's far better or there's far more space and empty buildings like towards the like west side of germany right from like wedding onwards there's a lot more space that you can go out there and sort of um you know build uh mega clubs or small bars whatever it may be so it will definitely then open up the scope of partying in that sort of city and just give people more opportunities to play in different places see different people you need that sort of variety theaters museum and concert halls are among the venues because of the cultural while betting shops brothels Arcades and cinemas are considered to be entertainment. Bergen alone was awarded the status of culture institution back in 2016. I remember that one. It says here, we would like to thank the members of the Parliamentary Forum, in particular for their commitment and perseverance in this matter. Said Pamela, how do you say that? We'd say Schub, Schuber. Is that Schub? Is that Schuber? Or is that Schubes? I'm sure that B is double S, right? This, this little weird B. Is that double S? Schubes or Schuber or Schubes, one of them, Pamela. Let's call her Pamela of the Berlin Club Commission. She said, with today's decision, the Bundestag is sending a strong and long overdue signal to the Republic. Music clubs are cultural institutions um, that shape the identity of the city districts as an integral part of the cultural and economic life. Now, an outdated law is to be adopted for reality. This keeps this helps to keep cities and neighborhoods alive and livable and to protect the cultural places from displacement. It sounds like something that's run through a Google Translate, but still, you get the gist. Um, dot for Debor, spokesman um, for stakeholder Livecom, said, We are counting on the federal government taking up this parliamentary mandate quickly and implementing the amendment of the building use ordinance of this legislation especially now in the times of corona we need this overdue step more than ever read an instagram post below there's an instagram post there but my things are loading but you get a gist in it you get a gist great news overall berlin declares clubs culture institution would that happen in the uk probably not um you know we've got absolute losers in charge you know the amy lammy donkey and flipping city can't run anything so it's not gonna happen anytime soon but definitely great to see someone doing it in the same pace hopefully it kind of will shame them into doing something but i'm not holding my breath 
next on the list what else do we have we have this weird news courtesy of art forum turner price 2021 shortlist five artists collectives which they and they aren't really artists right very odd um i've always kind of kept an eye on the turner prize and i've always had kind of um you know uh delusions of grandeur aspirations that I one day win it mostly because i remember the sort of first major contemporary artist i saw um or that i saw sort of recognized back in the day was had to be sarah lucas and then secondly had to be when steve mcqueen <coughs> won the turner prize 999 that's the first time i actually responded or sort of recognized what contemporary art was and from that moment on you know i paint and draw pretty well take loads of great photographs i've done loads of sculptures back in the day loads of things in it that i'm probably going to be debuting sometime very soon so watch this space but regardless um i've kind of always kind of kept an eye on it um obviously over the years it's kind of gone through a few changes there you know been some odd selection picks there's been times where people have shared prizes where they probably shouldn't have like some odd things have happened over the years and this is probably one of the final nails in the coffin as to the turner prize and what it actually means for artists and what it means for the artists in what for the art industry overall um there's this new thing where they've selected five artists collectives who none of whom actually paint they're collectives that do a lot of environmental stuff, societal things, structural things, but nothing that involves actually putting paint on a bit of canvas. So, so bizarre, um, considering the history of the Turner Prize and also just an unnecessary change. If you're going to do this, why not just make your own prize? Or why not make another prize that isn't the Turner Prize? Why does it have to be the Turner Prize that gets sort of like ruined to fit this kind of new thing that we're in at the moment it just seems odd especially when you'd want especially when you'd say the one thing that sort of maybe prevents a general consumer from getting into contemporary art nowadays is the lack of actual i wouldn't say skill but the lack of interesting things out there right like there's no one actually doing there's not there's not a lot of people which is why the ones that do pop pop really really big in a big way because most artists kind of suck nowadays, isn't it? There's not a lot of interesting artists themselves as people. Um, you know, the industry is sort of like um, iced out or sort of phased out the quirky, um, against the grain, controversial sort of like artist figure that kind of produces great work. They don't really exist. Everyone's sort of like lukewarm, mayonnaise personality. And then the work itself is fairly forgettable, fairly, fairly forgettable outside of some of the legacy or some legacy, outside of some of the old legends who, you know, display works in some of the bigger galleries. You could go to any number of contemporary art galleries in your city and you probably wouldn't remember any of the work that you saw. It's pretty forgetful. Um, who knows why it is, but if ever there was a need to uphold a certain standard and kind of use the Turner Prize as the overall benchmark for where we are or the litmus test or whatever it may be, it would be now, right? You wouldn't want to lower your standards to fit the current narrative. That's why I wouldn't think anyway, but hey, what do I know? It says, our forum, it says, for the first time since the award's inception in 1984, the organizers of the Turner Prize have announced that the five finalists under the consideration are all artist collectives with no individual artists being nominated. The prize, considered one of the world's most prestigious, is named for the 19th century painter, J.M.W. Um, J. Turner. Obviously, if you're familiar with some of his like, pre-war, war around the world war uh, paintings landscapes of different parts of the uk um you know they're literally incredible you can just sit in front of a turner for a year for hours and hours and you wouldn't be bored and it continues awarded annually to uk visual artists this year's prize was eagerly anticipated as last year's cancelled owing to the covid19 pandemic so after a pandemic they decided to then you know allow five collectives to do it. it's just what one of the great joys of the Turner Prize is the way it captures and reflects the mood of the moment in contemporary British art. So Tate Britain's director, Alex um, Farouk, is it Farouk? Farouk Harson, Alex Farouk Harson, who chairs the prize's judging panel. After a year of lockdowns, when uh, very few artists are able to exhibit publicly, the jury has selected five outstanding collectives whose work has not only continued through the pandemic but become more relevant as a result. That doesn't even make any sense. So because you're on lockdown, that means you can't paint. If anything, I'll imagine if you're an artist, you've been painting more so now than you have done before because you've been spending a prolonged period of time at home and the times that you were available, able to go out, the first thing you probably did was hit the studio, right? And, you know, great painting comes from great suffering. So if ever there was a time when you could really 
that doesn't make any sense really does it It doesn't really all five groups of shortlists are known for their social activism so let's see what the groups are right i think we've got here on the guardian so the groups are the name of the group we've got boss b-o-s-s -S, is a london-based collective which works across art sound and activism it was formed in 2018 by and for QTBIP, what? QTIB POC, queer trans intersex, intersex black people of color. Bruv, if ever there was a club that I didn't want to be a part of, even if I was, that's the thing. Maybe I'm just against groups and collectives, but uh, maybe being loosely associated to one is fine. Lucy associated to one is okay but being part of a team and standing in front of a sign or wearing the same t-shirt yuck like even if I was one of these people right if I was part of one of these communities the last thing I'd want to be is like in a group of people with the word boss on a t-shirt like yeah 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 anyway it continues cooking sections is a london-based duo daniel fernandez pasquale and alan schwab um, who are essentially food out activists come on recent work highlighting the conditions of the farm salmon pork food um take prompted take to take it off the menus completely yo what, what, what happened to just being a good at making art drawing making sculptures Gentle Radical was established in Cardiff 2016 and described itself as an artist and others run project with an ethos on that the marginalism is our mainstream. It advocates art as a tool for social change. Judges praise members of the group for their deep commitment to the hyper local community of the Riverside. Okay, oh, this social justice change thing is dumb, but if you really wanted to impact change and you really wanted to represent things that aren't really being looked at or have a be a voice for a pop, yeah be a voice for people that aren't really being heard wouldn't actually making art be the best way to do so putting these people like on front street taking great f pictures of people um painting a landscape depicting something from memory interpreting different stories via art like something that would have been a better way to do the art even in a film piece or something like come on man these groups like what and i'm i don't know and are these people even from the communities that they're purporting to represent or is it just like white trust fund kids who if they didn't set up boiler room are now setting up flipping art collectives that oh jesus give me a headache it continues project artworks is a collective of neurodiverse artists and makers based in eight oh my days so neurodegenerative people that suffer from neurodegenerative diseases have now formed an artist collective based in hastings judges praise their continued work through pandemic with a possibly passerby able to see examples through the windows of the clothes oh my jesus christ um farouk harris said the idea of focusing collectives that works in pacific communities to response to emergencies of our time particularly life under covid is quite particular to our time and i hope people will relate that each of these artists works visually in some way or another in film installation paintings and so on as well as being that people sometimes call social practices so the collectives have some form of painting some form of what you'd say conventionally would be described as art but they're in a collective so there's no way to actually award it to one person uh why don't you just make another prize i don't really understand this i really don't why don't you just make another prize why does it have to be the turn of prize as to get not solid but it is solid with this nonsense i just don't get it man the legacy of it, like the amount of artists that lives have been completely changed from winning the Turner Prize, the amount of, like I said, for me, go, growing up in a really poor neighborhood with no real access to that world at all and seeing somebody that looked like myself, Steve McQueen, on stage, accepted an award for art and then doing my research and finding out what he was about, what school he went to, where he was, you know, um, where he was showing, who he was represented by, um, he's you know reading interviews, watching his movies, like that led me to have a lifelong exception of this guy, and also allowed me to understand that hey, I also could be an artist in my own right, which then allowed me to then go to A levels and study art, which then allowed me to go to Central Cinema, into study product design, like all these if uh, all these things were informed by seeing that one person that looked at myself on stage that's that's social change that's enacting change that's giving voice to the voiceless that's inspiring people who probably won't have access to that sort of thing you don't need to be doing this forced clunky nonsense like it just ugh. yeah maybe it's just me maybe it's just me who knows um what else do you have here oh yeah we got this clip this is courtesy of the 
Chris Delia podcast and I'm going to say Bill Burr's podcast. So Bill Burr had this interesting point that he made um, on his podcast that got me thinking and then about cancellation, right? People getting cancelled and stuff. And I've kind of covered a lot of the people getting cancelled on this podcast, on my other main show that I do where I make little clips on YouTube. So definitely check that out. If you haven't seen him, I've done a few. I've done a recent one about Brendan Shaw firing Malik B from the Firing a Kid. But I speak a lot about stuff that's going on with LA comedians and their podcasts because I spend a lot of time listening to them. I'm fans of these guys. I went to LA in 2016. I went to the comedy... No, sorry. I went to the Laugh Factory. I went to the comedy store. I saw Tiffany had before she blew up like Hollywood blew up and she was just um hosting um in the comedy store which was flipping sick or was it Laugh Factory one of them I think it was Laugh Factory she was hosting and it was sick to then see her become this mega flipping Hollywood star it kind of really added weight to all the stories I've heard of people saying hey if you start being a door guy you could eventually lead to many bigger things so it's just great to see the whole thing so I'm a fan in general I'm a fan I'm a fan I'm a fan and obviously one of my favorite podcasts to listen to especially because it's a solo podcast is Bill Burr's right uh, Bill Burr's Monday Morning Podcast is one of my favourites and he had this interesting point that he said about cancellation that got me thinking and then there's another clip I'm going to play about um, Chris D'Elia where he also speaks about his cancellation and how that's affected him and I'll give my opinion on the fact that I don't really think you can get cancelled nowadays especially if you have fans you get cancelled from certain institutions and certain places but I don't think your career can be over completely if you have a fan base that's, but let's just hear what Bill Burr has to say about it first won't hire enough fucking people poor woman standing on a with her back to me is Aunt Mabel is it and um, I don't know I keep starting and stopping and failing can you help me, Babel? World, talk about la what language you oh, no, uh, see, a prime it? minister. Oh wait, one second, maybe see into. It. I don't like your thought process. Yeah. <laughs> to me, a, it, my daughter. Maybe see, it. maybe see. It. I was driving oh, home from oh, Mother's Day card, which I did. I bought my mom oh, one too. You know, Bear I bought Bear, all the mom, my mother-in-law, everybody, right? And uh, it's so weird to go in there and buy a mass-produced card. Oh, it's not here. Where right? is it? And I feel it. To the core of my l dot com it? code give me waffles and pancakes. Just watching it go into fuck. I'm sitting there talking to him. Where is it's it? It's built on fucking slave labor. Where is it? Why is it so big and beautiful? Uh, genocide and slavery. He said I couldn't pull out. Uh, I, was trying. I love those jokes, by the way. Okay, okay, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. It's that's coming what out. she said, and that's what he said. Always okay. funny to me. I don't care go, if they're here old here corny go. jokes. Here we go. Here um, we go. Or inappropriate at the workplace. I don't care. I like them. I stand by them. You know, it's funny. I was thinking about this whole fucking cancel culture thing. You, you know go. what the reality is? Is nothing. Uh, you really can't cancel somebody. Like, unless you get the cops involved and they actually get arrested and they go to jail. You know, but as far as like this whole bullshit that you've been canceled. I've noticed with with comedians, at least, is they post shows and the shows still sell out. And then what happens is the people that said they were canceled when they realize that they're not canceled is they then bully and attack the promoter of the show to try to get the show canceled. Um, that's what really happens. So that is one of those things that I just kind of hope goes away. When we, when, when, whenever we come back, that that goes away because that shit it really just expanded beyond these abusive monsters that were that were out there and needed to be dealt with. It just sort of then expanded into I don't like your thought process. <laughs> Therefore, we've decided your career and your dream is over. It's just like wait, what? What happened? When? When did? When did it expand into this? Talk to me about your politics. I don't like those. So obviously Bill Burr is largely right in what he's saying. I'm not going to argue with a great man. But the only thing I'll push back on is I think the only issue with these comedians getting cancelled and stuff and why they maybe feel like they are is that for the most part from what I've seen so far, a lot of the guys have been cancelled. Maybe with the, but specifically the, the last two that I've featured in terms of Chris Delia and Brian Cannon, you got the impression that they were more concerned with making it in Hollywood than they were with being you know successful and happy with their careers being just a stand-up they wanted to have the 
the the Hollywood experience too, right? Do a bit of acting, hosting, guest appearing on shows, whatever it may be. And the fact that they got cancelled, it completely derailed and essentially removed any possibility of them ever working in the conventional Hollywood entertainment industry because for the most part, it's not because these people have morals or ethics, it's because they don't want to risk the project getting tanked because they invest a lot of money into it because of your allegations so they usually distance themselves from you so maybe some of the producers and directors of the show don't actually believe that you're this person that the media is portraying you out to be or these allegations portray you to be but because it's a project that they sunk a lot of money into it's got a lot of investment their career is on the line they just can't risk having you associated with it because this might also affect the ability for those things to work and you know if you know and you think about movies and tv shows like they're not it's not the most easy thing to you know work on a show develop it make it and put it out there and it'd be successful right it's just one of those things that sometimes luck whatever it may be timing but it's not really easy so if you want to give yourself the best po best possible opportunity to succeed the last thing you're going to do is get someone involved who's been quote unquote publicly cancelled so that's why they tend to do it and on the comedian side of things they usually feel cancelled because they've tried to be a Hollywood star and now that's been taken away from them going back straight to going back only to stand up probably feels like a demotion it probably feels like a um uh, a crappy resolution to a situation that they <laughs> worked very hard to get themselves into which I can understand right if you're <coughs> an entertainer sorry it's you know making it to be a professional comedian or an entertainment figure in any way shape or form is really difficult there's no real straight line to the top it's very very hard to make it in the arts at all especially in stuff like stand-up right where literally you know anyone can stand up in front of a mic and do it it's like you know there's probably a uh, um there's probably an overabundance of people trying that thing same similar say maybe to djing so in order for you to break through and finally make it it really requires a lot of perseverance with that, with that good stuff so if, when you do end up getting there and they pull the rug underneath you from your feet. It, it is completely unfair, especially when the allegations are, you know, not true or the allegations alone. And also, I'm of the thinking, you know, if you've been alleged to do something, why can't we just publicly shame you and tell you you have a timeout instead of taking away your entire career? Why can't that be a thing also? And also, why can't your fans decide if you keep a career or not? Why is it that the industry decides to close the door when they have far worse closets, 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 far worse skeletons in their own closet, right? It just doesn't make any sense in that regard. And then I think, what was the end point that he made there? Da, 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 Oh, you're going away. I don't think it's going to go anywhere anytime soon. Um, only because I think people have now seen the power that they have with, you know, putting them together a little bit, a few clips about, you know, yeah, it's not going to go away because people now see that they have power, right? They know that if they put together a compilation of some of your worst tweets, you know, take something you said out of context from a podcast, they know that they, they can really affect your life negatively. So then, you know, that, come, that comes with power. That gives you a sense of... Uh, purpose or whatever it may be right it gives you whatever it may be it, it does something to people's psyche so uh, the attention the clout whatever it may be so it's unlikely it's going to change overnight it's going to require us maybe societally saying hey that isn't cool anymore we don't really like this sort of stuff we don't like being judged people being judged in the court of public opinion we're now going to give people due process or whatever it may be or give people you know industry timeouts whatever because they're losing great artists i don't know it's going to require a societal thing it's not going to require it's not going to just happen overnight it's not going to be one person deciding i'm not going to tweet this it's going to require everyone in society saying nah we don't stand for this anymore going forward and then off the back of that chris D'Elia said something which then rang true to what i'm thinking in terms of these people mostly just being upset that they can't um be uh Hollywood stars that they kind of dreamed that they were going to be. This is Crystal Lee on one of his recent podcasts, basically speaking about how he got cancelled and how that's a brief comment about how it kind of negatively affected what he's doing at the moment. I'll play that for you now. Waving in neighbors. What happened? Slept nine hours. Oh, you don't have a job? No. <laughs> no, I'm not for a while now. I'm cancelled. Um,. <laughs> Waving a neighbor. What happened? Slept nine hours. Oh, you oh, don't have a do job? Small screen. No. No, I'm <laughs> not for a while now. I'm canceled. Um. Yeah, awkward, isn't it, right? Waving a neighbor. But also very accurate in terms of probably how he's feeling. 
because he was on the cusp of stardom stardom right i think he spoke quite a lot on his podcast about his desire to be an action movie star how he loved tom cruise he was a fan of keanu reeves right he really wanted to be that guy and effectively got pulled away from him due to again allegations and maybe some of it's true some of it's false who knows but i think part of the reason why we haven't seen Crystal Lee do stand up um, and sell out a show because he easily could. I'm, I'm saying this now categorically. If he put out a tour, it would do pretty well. If he decided to do a comeback show somewhere, it would do pretty well. Like he's still probably well regarded within the LA circle in terms of comedians because they saw him actually kill on stage. Regardless of what he might have not got up to outside of it, they know you know that he has the power. He has the uh, ability to move a crowd in a really in a way that not a lot of people can do. Um, he sold a bunch of tickets, which I'm sure probably didn't it really uh, sit well with a few people who thought they were better than him comedically but for sure if he decided to announce a tour tomorrow he would sell that out in an instant but I think part of the reason why we haven't seen him on stage is because either he feels embarrassed or and ashamed of what happened and he doesn't want to expose himself right putting himself on stage is like the ultimate um, level of exposure there's this thing that someone said I forgot who said it but uh, supposedly the reason why we have an innate fear for talking in public is because you know back in our our ancestors basically um, used to have to address a public crowd in on trial like if you're accused of something like a crime and you wanted to uh, fight your case you were basically required to stand in front of the village or the town wherever you were from or the plantation whatever right and basically fight your case right um so like d d defend yourself that way in front of an audience and obviously it was a nerve-wracking experience and that kind of you know was a precursor to maybe you you know being executed being ostracized from your group um so that kind of has passed down to us from our ancestors which basically leads us to always have a bit of a um a be a bit apprehensive when we have to get in front of stage so you can understand somebody was accused of what he's accused of feeling a little bit like you know what i don't want to expose myself right now because you know as soon as he gets on stage the op-eds and the flipping articles will restart again the campaigns to get clubs to cancel his dates will just go keep going he's kind of kind of he's kind of been able to keep his head under the water um and sort of like you know carry on doing his thing without much attention being drawn to him so that could be one or it could be the fact that he sees it now as a crappy sort of a backup plan not backup plan but you know it, it, from from wanting to be a big hollywood star to now only only doing stand-up quote-unquote like i still think it's a bloody one of the best jobs in the world to have you know stand on the stage and tell flipping dick jokes but to go from being the netflix guy to maybe having a big hollywood movie with what is it called that's that the done the thing where i don't know what it's called that crappy movie that they've got with the wrestlers and stuff in it to then just doing stand-up i can see why he's a bit apprehensive i can see why again i don't agree with it personally i think he should still do it and if he's got the ability to make money that way then why not but i can definitely understand why he do that so like i said i don't think i don't think people can get cancelled and if they got fans right you can still perform in front of your crowd and your fan base but i think for the most part if you were hoping that you would make it in the industry and you know you're working your way through networking schmoozing with the right people appearing on the right things saying the right things on shows and then suddenly that gets taken away from you i can understand why doing only stand-up could seem a bit you know a bit crappy and you would prefer just to kind of like sit on the sidelines but in terms of cancer people take away their entire career if they don't have fans cool because that's usually industry people i think if you're in the industry you should be nervous about getting cancelled because you know you don't really have fans because you just you just basically act and say people's lines and you just you know what i mean there's nothing people can really back you with as an individual but if you have your own podcast you have your own audience you do videos you write blogs whatever it may be you record dj mixes you'll be fine you'll be perfectly fine um, but you just have to weather the storm, you know, the social media outrage storm, but you should be okay. Next on the list. Oh, yeah, we have this embarrassing um, altercation between, uh, what you call it, Jake Paul and Floyd Mayweather for some odd, bizarre reason. I don't know. Don't ask me why. Um, they're meant to be, for Lo what, Logan Paul's going to be fighting um, Floyd Mayweather, and I guess Jake Paul being Logan Paul's brother turned up to offer some brotherly support and to kind of stoke the fires of the fight and create a basically a bit of a hollywood blockbuster moment which led to a very strange altercation between the two guys which we were unable to it's really interesting that they had this big scrap or scrap quote unquote but we didn't get any real clear footage of floyd actually punching him in the face we saw the black eye so something maybe did happen but we didn't actually get to see any of the footage you know usually you get better you get a better fight footage 
from clips that you see on flipping world side hip-hop and look at the amount of cameras that are here in this shot alone that i've got on screen we've got one two three four five six seven eight nine 10 11 12 12 already in shot only in shot 12 cameras and look at that and the flipping boom mic picking up all the necessary audio and we still didn't get clear footage of the actual incident itself but anyway they're going to be fighting on june 6 floyd, floyd versus logan paul and jake paul got into floyd with his face they had some exchange and this is how it went down Took his hat and run off. Still no clear footage, took the bodies. Logan got involved too. gist of it right you get the gist um <coughs> and then this obviously led to this picture of jake paul obviously enjoying every single minute of it he's right or left eye looks like it's a bit swollen uh, it looks like he might have a black eye there his shirt's obviously ripped and disheveled i'm not sure if she still has the hat and then he went ahead and got a tattoo of the got the hat catchphrase that he's now i guess copyrighted and probably got merch selling on his site of it and you know, tattoo artist um, inking the got the hat thing on his leg. Gotcha hat, him eating a sandwich. You know, just being the guy that he's always kind of been, you know, throughout his career. So I guess, I guess this is going to drum up some interest for the fight. It has for me because I wasn't paying attention. Um, you know, generally, I think, you know, Logan Paul is probably going to get beat pretty bad. I just don't see any possibility how somebody that just learned to box what in the last five years or so is going to beat somebody that's been doing it all their life we've basically seen that experiment already when floyd fought conor, Ma conor mcgregor i was one of the people that believed conor mcgregor had a chance i believed all the ideas about his stance is going to be weird he's going to come in different angles and all this stuff i believed all that nonsense when really the fact of the matter is that Floyd Mayweather was like well at that time he was 49 and oh um he was he's seen just about every single style there is out there even if you think he's had a lot of gimme fights he's seen everything he had an amateur career i assume he had a pro career um he spent countless of times in the gym he's not one of these boxers that just on the off season gets really fat he runs a lot he still does push-ups and sit-ups all the time he's a bit of a freak in that way he doesn't really drink so he's in prime condition right to really make um, the best of his athletics abilities and his God given gifts and do them for as long as possible. We saw what he did to that Japanese kid, that Muay Thai champion, right? Spanked him so hard, the guy's like crying in the ring. Obviously, he TKO'd um, Conor McGregor, um, who's one of the better strikers in the UFC. So, for people to think Logan Paul has a chance is just nonsense. But again, it's a spectacle. I wasn't going to pay attention to it, but now this nonsense it has, has actually worked. So, as much as Jake Paul is kind of a, not the most um, likable figure in the world, this nonsense that he does does have some um, benefit to it because it makes someone like myself that wasn't paying this any attention to be like, you know what, let me check this out. 
why not? Let me check this out. I've got nothing else better to do on June the fifth. So, I mean, is it June the fifth? It is the date. It says, I think it's June the fifth. I'm pretty much sure it said June the fifth. Let me double check. I think it's June fifth. The Mac Life phone. Let me see. I think it was a screen on the side. It said June fifth. Right? Is it June fifth or June sixth? Go to the back. June sixth. Sorry, June sixth. Pay per view. It's gonna be on Triller. I'm assuming right is it Triller or no it's Showtime actually yeah Showtime because I remember Brenda Schulp said that he might be commentating which is funny considering he spoke about um, alleged incident that involved Flame River in the passing of his ex-wife or something which was incredible to hear someone was saying that out loud in that way but hey what can you do so yeah let me know if you're watching the fight I'm not really that bothered to be honest but you know something to do something to do let's see how much time I've wasted already speaking and ranting we can continue do a couple bits more oh yeah this is one so um Elon Musk hosted Saturday Night Live over the weekend and it was pretty decent um most so for Elon less so for the actual um cast of Saturday Night Live and the comedians that are on there all the time less so for them except with the exception of maybe Michael Che that new stuff he does is really funny it was great to actually see when he took the money out of his pocket and just making that um so, you know doing that kind of back and forth with Elon about Dogecoin and the dollar and stuff um, he's wearing actually jeans you know when he's doing that whole new segment he wears jeans and just puts a blazer and a shirt on oh, that was quite funny to see that because you could see a bit of his you know bottoms as he was ruffling through his pockets but yeah Elon Musk hosted Saturday Night Live and it was pretty nice I'm gonna be honest um uh, it was great he did a little monologue in the beginning and sort of gave a shout out to his mum during I think Mother's Day obviously as it says here in the New York Times their back and forth was a bit cringe a little bit awkward but again she's a mum you know what i mean it's pretty hard and difficult to do that thing in front of a live audience um on time and make it somehow comedic they felt fairly robotic but hey it makes sense they're just they're just two ordinary people in front of a camera on the biggest stage in the world and it's just going to be always a bit awkward and then um elon announced that he had asperger's 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 right uh, however you pronounce that um, a neurodegenerative disease which he hadn't really disclosed beforehand. I'm not really sure if he had said anything. Obviously, if you're a fan of Elon and you're a fan of the stuff that he does and the companies that he's founded, you would have, you know, been under some, you know, suspicion that he had something going on. But again, it's none of our business, so you keep that stuff sort of private. He doesn't need to share anything with us. And it also <coughs> maybe lends credence as to why he's so um, enthusiastic about Neuralink. Um, you know what he's doing with the chips that are going to be implanting people's brains and how that could, you know, basically see a future where people's sights are restored and their ability to walk and all this sort of like really cool stuff so maybe that was kind of spurned by his early diagnosis of having asperger's but that was pretty cool that he revealed that but it's also pretty awesome that somebody like him never actually used that as something to boost himself because for as fame hungry and attention hungry as elon is he never once used it as something that he could maybe propel himself forward with and um, even after he announced it on saturday night live he didn't follow it up with an explanation post he didn't do some sit down on the camera and they talk about it, nothing he's just kind of gone on like life is normal which has been pretty refreshing to see somebody for once not victimize themselves even though they probably have all the reason to do and everyone will have the great sympathy for them if they did it was refreshing that he didn't do so so this is kind of of Elon, uh, sorry, Elon Musk, um, New York Times, Elon Musk hosts a Mother's Day episode of Saturday Night Live. The multi, um, sorry, the much discussed Tesla and SpaceX executive took a self deprecating approach, telling viewers, I'm pretty good at running human in, in uh, running human in emulation mode continues in the end an episode of Saturday Night Live hosted by Elon Musk turned out to be exactly that no more and no less Musk the billionaire chief executive of Tesla and the founder of SpaceX appeared in several SNL sketches this weekend playing characters that included a doctor at hospital that case a generation Z patients which may be one of my favorite sketches very cringe it'll probably make you barf into you barf in your own mouth but in terms of being funny it was really well especially the flipping supreme urn like uh, epic epic stuff definitely check it out the producer of an icelandic talk show tv show that was really good too and the video game villain warrior um he used his opening monologue to share some personal details about himself introducing viewers to his mother and discussing his diagnosis for asperger's syndrome and to graciously plug a cryptocurrency um sure a couple of sketches felt a little eager to polish uh, marx's public image like a film segment that cast him in a mission commander to an effort to save the martian colony running dangerously low on oxygen Meanwhile, it's up to Pete Davidson playing his hapless doofus character Chad to save the day on a red card planet. 
Um, even so, Musk's presence didn't stop SNL from taking a few satirical pot shots at him. Colin Just, a weekend update anchor, noted during the portion of the show that debris from the Chinese rocket had crashed into the Indian Ocean only a short while late earlier. He said, and for once, we, and we know it's not Elon's fault. A lot of people have been wondering, why is he hosting the show? And now we know it's because he needed an alibi. That was pretty funny. Musk took opportunities he did, um, he could to humanize himself to the SNL audience. As he said, in the monologue 21 offended. I just want to say I reinvented his electric cars. I'm sending people to Mars on a rocket ship. Did you think I was going to be chill, normal dude? So that was pretty funny too. Um, overall, it was good. Um, the lead up to it was quite cringy. SNL cast members saying they weren't going to appear on camera with him for reasons I don't know. Um, one of them being that Bo and Yang guy. He was one of the main people that was involved in the sketches. So I guess he was able to kind of put his um, personal grievances about Elon to one side and c could communicate with him. Um, you know, or do the or do the sketches with him. So I'd be interested to hear. I wonder if you ever do so, if you ever spill the beans as to what happened behind the scenes, because I'm sure there was some fairly deaverish um, behavior going on with some of the SNL cast members when he arrived. So that was pretty decent to watch uh, overall. But I think as SNL, um, as an actual thing, I can't understand why all these LA podcasts I listen to are so obsessed with SNL when it's that crap. It is horrendous. Like one of the worst TV shows to watch in terms of sketch comedy. Surely this can't be the pinnacle of American sketch comedy. It can't. I refuse to believe it. There's people on YouTube. Hell, even what's his name? Um, yeah, what is uh, what's his name? Oh, what's his name? Jesus Christ, Ellis. What's he got fired from flipping SNL? Who does um the uh, Matt? Matt, yeah, Matt. Is it Matt and Shane's secret podcast? Well, Matt and Sh what's his name? Secret podcast. What's the guy's name? Uh, duh, 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 duh. Man, shit, what's Shane Gillis, that's it. Shane Gillis, remember he got fired from it, right? He does, he's got this YouTube channel where he does some sketches with his friends and they're great. Easily better than anything I've ever watched from SNL. Obviously, Tim Dillon does some great sketches too that are really funny. Um, uh, Andrew Schultz does a sketchy type improv some stuff for a little bit. He's got that music video at the moment. All that stuff is way funnier than this stuff. Like, SNL is trash. Like, I found some of the sketches so cringy, especially the comedians are on it. They're not funny at all. It's all these weird social justice messages framed in comedy, cultural things. Like, it's really bad. It's honestly the worst thing I've seen in a very, very long time. And Elon Musk was basically a bit of fresh air in it. He, like, he kind of took it really well he went in it loosey-goosey he was falling around a lot you could see he's having a really good time with it he was obviously great in his um custom jivon she suit that matthew williams let us all know that he made which was great <laughs> um but yeah the show overall was pretty crap but maybe the main reason why he went on there was to basically promote this what is it no it's not that uh, to promote the cyber truck <laughs> So he arrived in New York, driving the Cybertruck all around New York. Um, great bit of marketing um, there, to be honest, right? Genius level of marketing, actually. Driving it all around the streets of New York. Him and flipping Grimes and Toe. It looked flipping incredible. Legitimately, I cannot wait to see what people do when they get the Cybertruck themselves and how they basically customize them and make them look a bit different, you know, than everyone else, whatever. If people put rims on it, if they wrap it in different ways, because the car itself looks, look at that. Imagine you're crossing the sidewalk um somewhere in the states and you see somebody driving past in that it looks like nothing else on the road that, that might effectively change how cars look could you know forever and ever because one thing i would say is a bit of a car fan from you know i guess car design went kind of fell off a cliff maybe late 90s the designs of cars just started to get a little bit boring and a little bit you know samey and safe whereas this is suddenly looks like nothing you've ever seen on the road the cyber truck it looks flipping incredible look at that look at the headlights like what an amazing an amazing specimen of a vehicle so i'm really anxious to see what people do when they get theirs um so so many flicks of it so this might have explained the main reason why elon decided to do snl you know like this this um marketing campaign leading up to it where people are deciding that they're not they're not gonna rush the show or they're not gonna take part in it because there's Elon he's a billionaire and then all this stuff with him driving around New York in this cyber truck is definitely going to make people wanna order 
um, more of these cars when they finally become available, especially when he, they're more of them on the street. Because there's a lot of people have pre ordered now, obviously, because of the crazy cheap pre order price of a hundred bucks, whatever it was. But I'm sure there's going to be even more people that are going to end up buying them once they have their friend or somebody in the area purchased one. That's how it always works, isn't it? With most cars, people love to kind of just copy what everyone else is buying when it looks a bit cool and they've seen it in kind of real life. So for sure, that will end up happening. And then we've got one last image here of the Cybertruck in the Tesla store. It looks like in Manhattan, right? So they parked up there. I'm sure you could have even pre-ordered it there right there on st inside in store as well. So a great piece of marketing, merchandising, sales, influencer marketing, whatever you call it. Um, really worked really well. Look at that. It's even got a license plate attached onto it. Like bloody awesome. Excellent, excellent, excellent. It looks fucking fantastic, doesn't it? It really does look fantastic. I'm not gonna lie you can't say it doesn't look fantastic it looks fucking gorgeous so yeah big up elon musk big up elon musk anyway that's the excellent zinger show episode number 458 thanks so much for tuning in as per usual it's been a pleasure to have your company if it's the first time check out the show you know what to do smash the like button hit subscribe leave me a comment down below and i'll see you guys again for another episode of the show soon take care be safe peace